Hello. I think we're going to start. And um, I have, my, my name is Adele Santos. I was the, the dean uh, at the School of Planning, Architecture School of Planning, uh, here from 2004 to 2014. And uh, I'm still here as a co-director for the Center Advanced Urbanism and doing some teaching in architecture and in planning. So this panel is called From Instruction to Innovation. And I think the growth of um, innovation districts, uh, thanks to partnerships between universities, governments, and industry, uh, has led, in a way, to a new model, as actually described by Hilary Ballin earlier. Thank you, Hilary. That was very useful to me. Um, Kendall Square is um, our neighborhood. And it is the phenomenon that has res responded to the presence of MIT, to uh, attracted by the incubator of talent, by the uh, advancement of knowledge about the kind of level of research that is going on uh, at MIT. Um, but I have to say that when I arrived as dean in 2004, uh, the Kindle neighborhood was still a little dreary, to say the least. Um, it was bleak. Uh, people complained a lot about there was no place to eat, hence the food trucks. Uh, when people arrived at the tea stop, um, they would wonder where MIT was. Actually, they still do. Um, and uh, ast astonishingly, when we celebrated our 150th birthday, uh, the School of Architecture and Planning, along mostly with humanities, uh, decided to put on a festival of art, science, and technology. And, um, we managed to get Memorial Drive closed um, on two evenings between uh, the bridge and so we could actually wander down to the river and use the river. And we invited the public into not only the grounds of MIT, but also our buildings to see the artifacts we'd made. And I was absolutely struck by the conversations I had with the public who actually made me realize that in fact, we were seen as a precinct. And I'd never seen it that way. Uh, but there it was, the joy of actually coming in and seeing what we were doing and exploring the grounds. Um, it was amaz amazing. Anyway, here, 12 years later, the Kendall neighborhood is actually an innovation district, quite evidently. Um, it's a vibrant place, lots of places to eat, lots of things to do there. Um, the East Campus plan, which is now in process, uh, was actually in response to this new reality. We had this part of the campus that we could expand into. And it was quite clear there was the opportunity to build a strong linkage uh, with the neighborhood. And although I think 77 Mass Avenue will remain the formal entry to the campus, our new gateway that's actually being planned uh, is being de designed really to create a, a zone of town and gown interaction. And it will actually function as the main entry to the campus, actually, because that's where the people are. So finally, Harvard had its Harvard Square. We had not much, but now we have our own supportive neighborhood. So with that in mind, I am going to bring up the first speaker. And I've cut their bias down, by the way. It's a little embarrassing, but that's all we could do. And they've all been instructed to speak um, within 10 minutes or so. So the first speaker is Israel Ruiz, who is the executive vice president and treasurer at MIT. He's the Institute's chief financial officer and is responsible for administering the Institute's 5.2 billion capital plan through 2030. Seems like a headache to me. <laughs> anyway, um, he is a true believer in the power of research, technology, and innovation to bring opportunity to people and improve the world. He's a true MIT person. He is actually a graduate of the MIT Sloan School of Management. Um, he's... Um, actually been involved also since the early 200s with MIT's digital education efforts. He co-led the task force that published the future of MIT education, which was a very, uh, very important document. He co-leads the 1.2 billion institute proposal to create a vibrant mixed-use development in Kendall Square and its transformation. And um, this is underway. And uh, I think it's really important, as I said earlier, that it really moves ideas from the laboratory which to, to the public arena, but actually we will be building a place to celebrate all of this. So, Israel. Thank you, and I'm, I'm 
Black dudes and Kanti are part of my bio, which is the head of war. So let me start with a quote. Let me start with a quote. Um, if I let you read the quote for a couple of seconds, um, you've all seen the newspapers about Kendall Square and the ecosystem around MIT, and you may actually have found this quote, but I would be astonished, actually, if you knew it. Any guesses from who this is coming from? It's coming from the director of public health from the Commonwealth. And in fact, notice I say director and not commissioner. And that should give you a, a clue about the time of this, this quote. And that's from January of 1917. And you may actually say, why do I start this way? And I, I want to start this way because despite I have only 10, 11 minutes and I'll, I'll talk fast. I actually went back to a passion of mine, which is, yeah, we moved in 1916. We're celebrating a century. But as a financial person and as the, the kind of institute steward of all these assets, I care about the day after the move. And MIT has an amazing archival history. And this quote comes from the report of the president from 1917. So just after we celebrated, so I know that after the celebration, John and Gail will go and toast. I'm not sure they were toasting when they were ending the 100-year move from Boston to Cambridge. So I wanted to extract a few more quotes for you to frame why it is in MIT's DNA, the ecosystem of innovation that we are propelling and seeing today. The first one is from President McLaurin, and it talked about the hopes and dreams of MIT that many, many, many years were now fully realized at the time of that crossing. At the time of now, that to have ample space and room for growth. And that's an important aspect that I'll then consolidate for you in a second. The second one, also from the same president, and dear to my heart was the cost. You don't see many people talking about the cost of the undertaking. It cost $7 million, which I took the time to calculate the inflation-adjusted dollars, and it's not that much. It's $130 million. So clearly, a lot's changed in the cost of buildings. And I know there are many architects and builders in the room, so think about what's happened. But $7 million for MIT was another quote that this is my predecessor, Francis Russell Hart, an MIT treasurer who had, as the only treasurer that has come back to the Institute to work twice. I, I'm not planning to do that. When, <laughs> but think about the comparison. The move from Boston to Cambridge took $7 million, and you know all the history about the fundraising and the role that it played to enabling that move. At the time that MIT's endowment was worth $5 million. Not $5 billion, $5 million. So talk about boldness and talk about what that represented in enabling what then came. And then finally is, of course, and I left it for the last one. Just let's stop about physical things. We're really an institution about human capital and talent. And of course, President McLaurin did not forget that and talked about the human capital. And it's an amazing report that I urge you to go. And it's 28 pages of fascinating reading including the fact that there's a section that talks about the problems of the future. So this is January of 17. They just moved and opened the main group and talk about that section. And I guarantee you, we're talking about the same problems today, 100 years later. So I pulled this into three what I call timeless ingredients. The first one is a special, let me call it even magical. Some of you talk about the connected campus. Magical physical environment. The second one, of course, I wear my hat, appropriate financial support. And the third one, the concentration of this diverse human talent with big hopes, dreams, aspirations. I'm not going to talk about the third one. You are, after all, at MIT. That's a given, certainly today. But the first two, I want to give you some sense. And then this historical sense is important. So 1917, now we're moving in decades, but think about what Kendall Square was at that time. 
And there was this advertisement, if you were a manufacturer, come to Kendall Square. This advertisement was run on national media from 1920s to 1940s. MIT had not explored all the way to Kendall Square. And you can find anywhere from Robert, from Ing, to not yet Candy. Candy came later. But think about all the industry and the industrial sense of the mission of MIT to solve the problems of this industry. You fast forward now to the 70s and 2000s, and you may recognize some of these buildings in the aerial picture. They're just two buildings on, to your left in 1973, and one is today Draper Laboratory, and the other one that you can see at the end is Volpe, the headquarters for the Department of Transportation. It took about 10 more years to develop by Boston Properties Cambridge Center to look like it looked in 2005. And if you keep moving, I will say MIT has run paranoid about running out of space since the crossing. You had one or two buildings, and for many buildings has been really doing a good job for decades to think about the aspirations and the hopes and dreams of the current and future generations of scholars at MIT, and to make sure that through the administration and well-doing of many, many people in the past, we are enough to fulfill what that will do in the future. We, nobody knows. We'll, de we'll dedicate it and determine that in the future. But in the meantime, what's happened is, well, what do we do with that land? Let me leave it at that. So I told you very quickly this painting of 100 years of physical. I want to give you another sense on the financial support and how the dynamics around the financial support have changed. The first one is the MIT proper finances. And I didn't have time to put the bar from 1917, but the bar from 1917 had zero research. The bar from 1917 had barely giving. The bar from 1917 was all tuition. And I'm going to leave the tuition number aside because it would cause some panic. But I will tell you that MIT charged on a per course basis. What you see is this evolution of like, the quintessential, after World War II, research university was born. Uh, research at that time represented north of 95% of the revenues of MIT at the time, post-World War II. You see the evolution to 81, 91, and then forward, and how the smaller sections of research proportionally to the endowment and the giving and the private support, the role of private support at MIT, the role of financial support to the hopes and dreams. But the blue part, it's still 28% of $2.4 billion today. And what's important is who's funding that 28%. So we started in 1917. Everything is funded through tuition with really 200, 300 students that MIT had at the time, all the way now to 2015, one third being research funded, and who's funding that research. So what you see here is that the research of MIT started with the World War II efforts, um, Dean Vannevar Bush. 97% in the 1940s was funded from federal sources. And it's come down to now below 66%. This year, we may be trending in the low 60%. So the non-federal sources of research support, which is at the end of the day what fuels MIT's inventions and technology uh, powers, is all coming from non-federal sources. And more than half of those non-federal sources are industrial and business in nature. So there's no other university like this one in which that number, which today amounts to a very big dollar amount, is funded through the industrial support. And that's the second point. The third point is, a lot has happened in the last 20 years in venture capital flows around the area. I'm just zooming in in biotech. There's an equal story on any other sector you want to think about. But in biotech, you can go 20 years back and think about the proportion of biotech venture capital funding around the area of the North, the, the New England area versus Silicon Valley. And I, I, I'm telling you, trust me, 99% of the New England area is Cambridge. So trust me on that data. I'm a data person. 400 million in 1995, 200 million was coming 
to this area. 200 million was coming to the Silicon Valley area, which is around UCSF, Berkeley, Stanford. You can see the evolution that in the last, in the last 20 years, the area of Cambridge, the area of Kendall Square, has now a, surpassed, basically equaled at $1.9 billion, the entire Silicon Valley area. And it's now to combine 60% of the entire US funding of biotech and venture capital. I'm not going to quote things you can get in the media, which is nine out of the 10 big farmers they moved to Kendall Square in the last 10 years or so. But this is one of the key drivers, financial support. OK, let me close this now. So now you have these three ingredients. And of course, in a timeless set of ingredients, which one am I missing? I'm missing time. So put these three ingredients together and give it time. And what you get is a dedicated set of conditions to create an innovation ecosystem. So today, this is the image, this aerial image from Cambridge looking into Boston, looking specifically, I chose this one to look at Back Bay, where we come from. And now the area of MIT academic represents something like triple the size of what MIT moved 100 years ago. But what's more relevant is who's around it. And who's around it is a bunch of companies so diverse, so intellectually stimulating, and so concentrated that are generating the intellectual pursuits back and forth between MIT, Harvard, any other academic institution in the area, and this region. I'm leaving aside the logos of 800 more companies that you wouldn't even recognize, but they are part of this ecosystem. So why am I saying this, and why is this the ecosystem that we're doing? Because that land that MIT was paranoid about accumulating to make sure that MIT future generations had could be put to use to do this. And I didn't have time today to go through the good work that went from all of the neighborhoods around MIT into Cambridge. You see Technology Square a little bit here, and then Kendall Square. And the latest one is our initiative. So I want to invoke 100 years of legacy and history in developing innovation ecosystems, innovation at large, to then show you what it's been shown now many, many, many times since the early 2010 we've been at this, and to just make sure that what MIT is trying to do here is, again, create the physical environment, the first ingredient I showed you, with the financial support to curate what's going to happen in the area around the T-stop of Kendall Square. Why? Because we believe in this concentration and density and in the creation of the acceleration of these innovation ecosystems. So when you think about what this may look like, hopefully in five to 10 years, what we want to enable is what has been enabled already and accelerated and expanded. Why? Because the mission of MIT, of pursuing research and innovation, is now directly linked in financial terms, in physical terms, and intellectual terms to the health of our surroundings. So I start with three observations. I want to leave you with three conclusions. Science and technology creates opportunity. It has been creating opportunity for more than one century. The concentration and our curation of this concentration accelerates the innovation engine. And the creation of these dynamic living environments are the essential components to make these innovation ecosystems vibrant, successful, and really become what Kendall Square is around today at MIT. Thank you. Thank you, Israel. That was terrific. My next speaker is Katie Stebbins, who is the Assistant Secretary of Technology, Innovation, and Entrepreneurship for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, she's had more than 20 years of experience as in city and regional development. She served the city of Springfield for 10 years, specializing in environmental planning and brownfield redevelopment. Uh, she's run her own consulting practice was a primary consultant for the Hollyoke Innovation District on behalf of the Massachusetts Tech Collaborative. Um, she's a city planner, 
and right now she's leading the application of lessons learned in the economic development of environments such as Kendall Square to spark growth in, of smaller cities in Leslie, less populated regions throughout Massachusetts. So, welcome, Katie. Thank you so much. I'm gonna speak from the podium. I hope that's okay with everybody. Thank you so much for having me today. It's such an honor, I have to say, to be able to speak with a panel of uh, such esteemed colleagues. I was joking earlier, I said, you know, I, I never could have gotten into MIT as an undergrad, and I doubt I could have gotten into MIT as a graduate student. But it's so nice that in my 40s, there's like this great equalizer that now we can all be colleagues and friends, and it doesn't matter, it's all good. <laughs> um, so it was introduced, my title is Assistant Secretary of Technology, Innovation, and Entrepreneurship for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I say very often that I have the best job. I mean, the governor probably likes his job, but I really love my job. Massachusetts is a leading technology state in the country, as we know. We have people all over the country and all over the world trying to mimic what we're doing. And it's an exciting and humbling experience as a city planner and economic development professional to be asked to lead the state's competitiveness agenda in tech innovation and entrepreneurship. So we all know the innovation economy is in great demand. Uh, it's exciting to work in Kendall Square. It's exciting to work in a growth economy. However, I have to say, my entire career, I was always drawn to those places that, that hardly had a heartbeat. Those economies that were so in decline, everyone just kind of said, what are we going to do with this place? Much of what we've looked at is Detroit recently, right? Or we looked at it Pittsburgh at one point, which is now turned around. These are places that don't have a university partnership. They don't have private industry. They might have some jobs, but the main office, the private industry, may not be in that town. They all have government. How many people think we can create innovation districts with just government? I know that's, that's a trick question, I know. But I'm from government, so I'm optimistic. <laughs> Um, but I came to this question, as I travel around the state, you know, I have to leave Boston, obviously, and I have to serve the entire Commonwealth. I had one CEO in a Boston company say to me, hmm, you're traveling around, we're looking at other parts of the Commonwealth. It seems suboptimal to me that we should be considering innovation outside of Boston. Oh my God. I can't go to Orange or Worcester or Bitsfield and look town leaders in the eye and say, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to go today. It is suboptimal to talk to you about your economic future in the innovation economy. Uh, I, I'm not going to do that. So what's so great is that I get to go to these towns and I say, OK, you don't have the trifecta of the university, private industry, government partnership, this golden unicorn that we all love, that we know has done so much in Boston. We love the golden unicorn. Uh, but I believe that we can build the stool this differently. So over the next 10 minutes, I just wanted to talk about how we do this. Because that's the beauty of innovation. It's about new models. It's about new rules and new players and new ideas. So number one, how do we grow and scale innovation districts and ecosystems in places that don't have the beautiful big golden unicorn, right? How do we encourage, secondly, how do we encourage this massive number of people who are the innovators, the makers, the hackers, the innovators, to go into the field of city planning? How do we get them to be in our governments? And third, and this comes from the title of this, of this two-day session of what is the next for a place like MIT? What do we do when Kendall Square is built out, the innovation district is here? What's the next role for university in innovation districts that aren't immediately at their borders? So on, on the first piece, so when I began my job, I directed my colleagues to find all of the innovation assets in the state. And I said, OK, I want to know about all the innovation assets. Go find them. And they said, all right, we're going to contact every business association. We're going to get their list. We'll take out the duplicates, and we'll be all set. And I said, oh, no, 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 no. I don't want to do that kind of a search. I said, picture yourself as like a jilted girlfriend. You are the crazy ex-girlfriend that needs to cyber stock everything innovation and cool in this state. And I want you to scrub it. And what was interesting is we did end up actually cyber stalking people. 
It wasn't so much the places, is that if you started following people on Twitter and social media, and you started to go to meetup.com, you started to find people all over the state, and you started to follow their patterns of where they were visiting, what did they go to, what meetups did they attend, where did they do yoga. You could find out this stuff on the internet. It's unbelievable. I'm sure if the people knew I was stalking all this about them, they'd have like the cease and desist from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. However, we went, we started with A, we went through Y, we ended up with over 800 innovation assets in the state of Massachusetts, and we did not map Boston or Cambridge. The innovation economy is very much alive throughout the state of Massachusetts and all four, all four corners of the state, many times without the golden unicorn. So when we find this stuff, we find groups of things. I meet with community leaders and I say, hey, Mr. Town Manager, you're not gonna believe what you've got in your borders. I found this group of you know, digital comic book illustrators meet up that get together every Wednesday. And I found this team of kids who are doing a robotics club and their parents are very involved in robotics. Or, hey, I found this roller derby team that's doing 3D printing of their trophies and gathering skaters from a startup community. Isn't this amazing? I have to say as an aside, the only reason I know about the innovation economy in the roller derby community is because I skated on the team. And when I worked for the Holyoke Innovation District in Western Mass, I was working really hard in Holyoke doing just this. What are all the innovation assets that we can find around Holyoke and Springfield and Chicopee and Western Mass? And I saw that the roller derby team was looking for, quote, fresh meat. And I thought, oh, I'm going to check this out. This must be innovative. These are startup people. These are creative people. I went in. I strapped on my skates. I hadn't done that since I was a teenager. I have to admit, I fell in love with it, fell in love with the creative people, the innovators, fell in love with full-time contact sports, um, and quickly realized there is a whole network of roller derby teams in the state of Massachusetts, which have innovators and artists and creative people getting together and building this economy too. And so I get to go to these towns and I say, all right, you've got these people, these people know how to work with their hands, these people know how to hustle businesses. How do we build a community with them? And they say, well, I don't get it, why do I care? And I said, well, these people have come to us the state and they say, yeah, we used to be one or two people in Meetup, but now we've got 10, now we've got 15, now we've got 25. As Israel mentioned, we're gaining critical mass. We can't do this out of our living room anymore. We need a space. So they come to us at the state and they go, do you guys have any money to help us put a space together? Because essentially what they're proposing at the end of the day is rebuilding the community center, right? So they do this, and they say, oh, OK, we need to rebuild the community center. We need to make maker spaces in it. We need to put technology spaces in it. But the town planners, the DPW directors, the code enforcement people who have to enforce the bylaws go, oh, God, so a maker space. How do we classify that? Is it a place of assembly? Is it manufacturing? Is it dangerous? Are you using chemicals? Suddenly, we don't know how to classify these things, right? A co-working space, a co-working. So you're all going to work together. Do I classify? Well, we don't really have offices. Well, if you don't have wall and offices, how the heck am I going to classify what your co-working space is? So suddenly, we realize we have to be having these conversations at the local level. And over time, we show value to the local leaders and build relationships between these communities, which is wonderful. Then we start to see new opportunities open up, workforce development. We start to see the workforce development government people starting to take advantage of makerspaces as training grounds for people in manufacturing. So how do we start to take what's happening as a critical mass of community resources from our innovators and turn it into a greater framework for economic development? And now there's a value of them coming together. So this brings me to my second point about who are the next city planners? I believe that we need to begin the roadmap of building innovation districts by sharing our profession more broadly and inviting the entrepreneurs and inviting the artists, the designers, the hackers, the makers. We need to find these people in the neighborhoods that we're working in. We need to serve and offer them the educational tools to be our colleagues and not just our constituents. And I'll get to that on my third point, which is where I think the university partnerships are going to be critical. These budding ecosystems, they're hungry for so much more. We've, so now we've looked at this. We have one leg of the stool that's community, right? We have another leg of the stool that's government. We've put a government leg on this stool. They're OK. But have you ever sat on a stool with only two legs? We need more. 
The evolution, of the evolution of these places is really exciting. We're now seeing vocational schools giving us proposals for vocational shops that are around hydroponic gardening and robotics and coding, things that we never would have thought of getting at a vocational education. This is working. So these communities, though, grow and the critical mass grows, and then they run out. They run out of ideas and people and resources, and they want more. And so this brings me to the third leg of the stool, which is the university partnerships, because there's so much knowledge and resource and opportunity in a university partnership. And how does a place like MIT imagine itself participating and helping to grow communities that want innovation frameworks, want to build their economies on this system, but they aren't right next door? What's going to happen, I hope, and we are seeing this in some places, is that universities are finding ways to partner in these budding ecosystems, finding way to offer more tools, offer more classes, virtual relationships, on-site relationships. And what's exciting is then the private sector comes up. Again, it is true. We need critical mass. So the private sector comes and they say, huh, you're starting to generate workforce. You're starting to generate people. You're starting to attract people to want to come live here. You've got a roller derby team. Who wouldn't want to live there, right? And so I will close by saying that it's my observation that the innovation economy, while it also needs critical mass, we also need to democratize it because it has to be available to everyone. We can build a stronger chair if it's available to everybody who wants to participate, not just thriving communities, but communities struggling to figure out what their next economic development framework is going to be. And so I look forward to the challenge of working with MIT into the future as how we build these partnerships and how we grow frameworks for the innovation districts and economies throughout the Massachusetts Commonwealth outside of Boston. Thank you. Thanks, Katie. That was pretty inspiring. Roger Duffy is our next speaker, and he is a design partner at the New York office of Skidmore, Owings & Merrill. Uh, his design work encompasses a wide, wide range of award-winning urban projects, from transportation-oriented developments, residential, hospitality, and office buildings. Office buildings. Um, his, the, the urban context, which is mostly where he, built, he, he, he works and has built in, uh, really include the adaptive reuse of 510 Fifth Avenue, uh, Cornell NYC Tech Master Plan, treatment of reclaimed space in Roosevelt Island, the University Center of the New School, the corner of Fifth Avenue and 14th Street. He's led um, two teams that um, have looked at the area around Grand Central Terminal and uh, Madison Square Garden. Uh, and uh, obviously, he is uh, a very experienced person uh, also in the academic context. So, Roger Duffy. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, John and Hashem, for organizing this wonderful uh, two-day event. Um, also, congratulations to um, MIT. Uh, we're all here because this is a center of excellence and innovation, and um, I think that's to be applauded. And congratulations on your centennial. So um, innovation districts is a subject I'm um, going to talk about today. And I've chosen to uh, bracket it around four, uh, four main subjects. So uh, the first is um, this idea of an industrial lab, uh, which was an early type of innovation district. Uh, next is uh, sort of the venture model. It's represented by Silicon Valley uh, and per perhaps Kendall Square. Third is a, a sort of par partnership model, uh, which is a hybrid that includes uh, government, so again, perhaps like Kendall Square a bit. And the last um, is a sort of placeless, geography-less place 
uh, the sort of shared research, shared innovation condition that exists uh, through the internet. So to start uh, with the first one here, uh, I'm gonna show you sort of best of breed uh, type projects just to uh, sort of frame uh, the thought process here. The first is um, a series of buildings uh, in New Jersey for Bell Labs. Um, and in particular, a cluster of buildings that was located in Murray Hills, uh, New Jersey. Uh, and in particular, building one that's shown here on the, the lower right, um, which is a, a building um, that in the history of science, a dangerous thing to say in a, in a, at a science school, and probably a room full of scientists uh, in the history of science in the 20th century, uh, arguably uh, a place where uh, the greatest leaps forward um, happened in this particular building. Uh, humbly, I, I might submit as an architect, uh, this was designed not by an architect, not by a famous architect, but by a scientist, uh, Mervyn Kelly. It shares many of the attributes that some earlier speakers talked about, this uh, condition of chance uh, interactions, this idea of visual connections, uh, this idea of interdisciplinary work, and this co-joining of um, theoretical research and applied research coming together uh, under one roof. So an important, an important place, and a place that um, really became the catalyst for many of the incremental developments that happened uh, starting in the mid-50s in Silicon Valley, starting with Fairchild uh, Semiconductor. Incidentally, uh, the, the beginning company of Fairchild Semiconductor was started by a scientist from Bell Labs, uh, William Shockley, who left uh, Bell Labs in 1955. He went home to Santa Clara, California, started a company called uh, Shockley um, Semiconductor, which failed, uh, but Gordon Moore and other scientists worked with him and started Fairchild Semiconductor. So the beginning of Silicon Valley really was spawned from this building, this complex, this innovation lab, this industrial lab um, in Murray Hills, New Jersey. So on to uh, Silicon Valley, sort of beginning in the mid-50s, sort of hit its stride in the early 70s. I would characterize this, again, dangerous for an architect to say, as incremental advancements. Uh, the big leaps in the 20th, early part of the 20th century happened at Bell Labs. So these incremental advancements in terms of the internet, um, in terms of cellular networks, et cetera, um, happened in and around here. Maybe the architecture isn't so important dangerous for an architect to say, but there was a kind of uh, networked condition of local providers, of um, people that are proximate to each other that, that focused on individual parts of these incremental advancements and lots of interesting things that have shaped our futures, my futures, uh, happened uh, in this place. So Bell Labs, great place, mid-50s, it's sort of put aside, 70s, 80s, 90s, there's the Silicon Valley model, and perhaps we're moving into a new type. Um, Israel showed an interesting data slide where more of the venture capital money is flowing to Kendall Square area and, and around Massachusetts. Uh, you know, interesting statistic, I guess the change has already happened away from the Silicon Valley model. This particular model is represented here by uh, Roosevelt Island, the project that I master planned uh, in New York City, and Marion, who speak next, uh, designed one of the buildings for. Um, and this uh, includes the ingredient of local government, uh, which was mentioned by the previous speaker. The fourth um, condition, which uh, I won't address here today, but just to introduce, is a subject that John and Hashem uh, will talk about tomorrow, which is this uh, networked, shared innovation, shared research condition uh, that's done via the internet, so geography-less kind of place. So a few um, mappings of um, innovation, uh, which is the focus here today, 
Um, and this is a mapping of, um, of um, the districts. And you, know, you have one here. New York is starting one uh, on Roosevelt Island. Uh, they have one um, in the Chelsea area of, of New York. But almost every city across America either has one or has started one of these innovation districts. So everyone's chasing the same thing. If you map uh, innovations by patents, you can see that um, a large cluster in California along the West Coast and also a large cluster in the Northeast, but also a fair amount of clusters um, in and around the center of the US, North and South. If you map it by uh, venture capital deals, which Israel did in a different way, you can see um, the sort of mapping of where are those innovations? So generally speaking, the money's chasing the innovations, uh, and they're betting on the future of that. Or you could map it by functional type. So when Bell Labs was um, creating this uh, research uh, operation, they did it with a clear mission to, uh, to determine what the future of communication might be. So within that narrow bracket, they made money advancements. Now the field of innovation is much broader and across many functional types from biopharma to communications to electronics to you name it. And this is a kind of mapping and showing you the diversity of, um, of that kind of research. So the, the ingredient of uh, the local government, the concept here is there's no epicenter to where these innovation districts happen. Uh, I think that's an important concept. And the other uh, distinguishing characteristic, I think, in the modern type is that they have different stages. Aside from becoming important, hopefully, uh, during a certain period of time and then obsolete until something new happens, they have sort of stages of life, like the, the famous Thomas Cole um, uh, paintings at the National Gallery in Washington, DC. Uh, so youth here would be represented by the uh, pre-startup and idea, and I'll show you how that applies in the Cornell Tech. Um, and then the startup would happen in a incubator kind of building, like the one Marion's uh, designing at Roosevelt Island. And those two things are designed to happen on Roosevelt Island, on this campus that we're designing with Cornell and Technion. And then the idea is that those companies, as they grow, would leap out of uh, that campus and into the environs uh, of, of, um, across the river in Queens or in Manhattan or somewhere else in the uh, environment, so not being sort of located uh, by a specific geography. And this mapping is um, one that just shows you the idea that uh, that the geography moves around as growth happens and as innovations happen in that area. So the picture of the site on Roosevelt Island, uh, it's 12 acres. It's the southern tip of Roosevelt Island, a mature community uh, sitting in the East River. Uh, there's a hospital that has since been um, decommissioned and demolished uh, that was previously on the site. The site. Um, had a series of encumbrances and opportunities. Um, we decided to use it as a way to connect, uh, to create a thoroughfare through the site um, uh, with views out, uh, looking out to, um, to the city and to the beyond, so implying a connection between this campus uh, and the vital city around it. The island is long and thin, has uh, lots of residences, schools, shops, different forms of life, and also a memorial on the southern tip by, designed by Louis Kahn. The hospital was formerly uh, an impediment uh, to the circulation systems. We were very respectful and humble in how we approached this project, uh, reconnected all the vital pedestrian and vehicular paths through the site, and have um, public connections through the new project. Five main characteristics of the site. Hyper-sustainability is the first one. So uh, net zero projects or lead platinum projects, the largest passive house project 
in the world, uh, which is a housing project that's under construction now. The project is designed for uh, resiliency from flooding. It's designed to um, exceed the 500-year floodplain um, in New York City. It's mixed use, including um, incubator space uh, for future companies. It's a truly public um, campus, no gates, no thresholds. Uh, Hillary mentioned that earlier um, today. And uh, this is uh, unique because it's privately owned public space, sort of a, something New York City, I guess, invented. I'm not sure. There's lots of those things. Uh, a lot of them get gated off. Um, in New York City, but this one is always open, no gates, no thresholds of any kind, uh, open 24 hours a day. And it's a phased development. It's a 99-year lease between the city and, the, um, and Cornell and Technion, uh, and they have to build out the full phase project, which is 2 million square feet of project, uh, by 2037. So this is a mapping of the floodplains. You can see the 500-year floodplain is elevation 13. The East River is a tidal estuary. It's not really a river, so it has tides in it. Um, and the ground floors and the main circulation will be at elevation 19, so well above the 500-year floodplain. The circulation, you can see, works around existing uh, barriers on the site. There's a gymnasium on the north side. It creates a diagonal path to existing parks north and south, and also a tram station and a tube station that connects to the rest of Manhattan. All the entrances to the buildings, uh, first phase and future, are located off the circulation spine. And the circulation spine has views out uh, to, um, to New York City, to the beyond. All the parks are outwardly focused, so no internal quads, like the earlier example of Columbia University, all facing the river, much like your quad that faces out to the Charles River with the, the dome. So the phase one is about 40% of the development of the 2 million square feet. It's about 50% of the uh, green space development um, for the site. There are four buildings uh, being designed. Uh, the tall one is a, a housing project that's Passive House, um, designed by Gary Hendel, developed by Related and Hudson Development Companies. The um, building in the foreground is the first academic building that is uh, paid for and designed, uh, sorry, paid for by Cornell and designed by Tom Main. Uh, the building with the diagonals uh, on the far right is the building that Marion's developing. Uh, it's owned uh, and developed by Forest City Ratner, uh, who's also developing all the site work, so a developer developing all the site work for this campus. And the fourth building uh, is not yet uh, being designed. It's under consideration. It's a hotel and education center, um, and it's... Uh, the building that's sort of in between being tall and being short. Uh, big emphasis on the spaces in between. Uh, they're as much a priority, as Hillary mentioned earlier this morning, as the buildings themselves, because they support uh, learning and education on this campus. And they represent more than half of the uh, land area that will be uh, preserved in and of the future. So thank you very much. Thanks, Roger. Interesting to see what's happening by Cornell. Thank you. And now we have Marion Weiss, who is the Graham Chair, Professor of Architecture at the University of Pennsylvania School of Design and co-founder of Weiss Manfredi, Architecture, Landscape, Urbanism. It's a multidisciplinary design practice based in New York City. I think the firm has done a number of projects that are quite well known, competition, winning projects such as the Olympic Sculpture Park uh, is in Seattle, the University of Pennsylvania Nanotech Center, Barnard College's Diana Center, 
the Brooklyn Botanical Garden Visitor Center. And um, in all of these, there's definitely a relationship between city, nature, architecture, and infrastructure. Current and upcoming projects include this mixed-use building for Kendall Square. I think we've had it referred to. Uh, it'd be very nice if we see that, Marion. I'm not sure if you will do that. And uh, also now the bridge at Cornell Tech's new campus in New York City. Maybe we'll see that one too. Um, she has many honors, she and actually the, the partnership. Um, the Academy Award for Architecture from American Academy of Arts and Letters. Um, new York City AIA Gold Medal of Honor, uh, among other things. And the Princeton Architecture Press has published two monographs on the work of the firm. So welcome, Marion. Thank you, Adele, and also thank you for uh, convening uh, here at MIT this 100-year celebration. Uh, it's an extraordinary thing to think about an institution that is inventing itself in real time at the 100-year mark. And as we start to think about what it is to create and invent a university and to create a setting, I think that a preoccupation that I share with my partner, Michael Manfredi, is really what is a kind of perspective, both literal and figurative, on what it means to create a place where we convene as, as individuals and choose to be together at a teaching institution, in a learning institution, in a research institution, as opposed to somewhere else. Um, you could say a fantasy uh, envisioned by an artist here, Raphael, in 1509 to 1511, the School of Athens, is truly in some ways an inspiration for what it is to perspectively converge in one setting, uh, all the intellectual leaders and philosophical leaders of time, you could see Plato uh, reaching for the sky, if you will, and Aristotle reaching down, but Copernicus, Ptolemy, uh, Euclid, they're all there, convening both across time and in one place, but somehow all together and understood through perspective. So if we start to think about this notion of perspective and convening a community, it is not just the planning, and we think as architects and plan, but it's the section and the perspective of how we actually simultaneously come together that I think is uh, evocative of how we think about shaping an institution. Now, if that was 500 years ago, Oxford uh, in 1096, I believe, when they founded an institution, convened a place much like a, a convent, if you will, fully enclosed, but gathering like-minded people together as part of the city, but still closed off from the city. If we think about MIT 100 years ago, then the idea of convening those same models, but not yet a closed courtyard, but one that's open-ended facing the river, um, found itself as one that was sort of central in nature and then had some signatures, like the infinite corridor, that said the place of circulation is a place of inspiration and convening. And that's occurred over time. Now, the whole idea of instruction, and from instruction to innovation, if you will, was a thesis, if you will, for the second part of the afternoon, is in some ways that kind of directed research or that directed organizational studio. You can see a, a research lab on one side, the architectural studio on the other. There was still a sense that through consensus, we would all learn the same thing and produce something that was viable out in the world. But in fact, you could say it's a places of retreat, and you could look here at Calder's studio or Tesla's laboratory as models where the individual would go off and, and in a laboratory environment or in a, in a loft-like setting, invent, destroy, and reinvent. And you could say that Building 20, the reason why it was so successful is what it was a low-lying building that nobody cared about, so people could reinvent it, tear it apart, and start all over again. Now, that gets to my thesis here with five projects, which I'll share, which is really a topographic social infrastructure is indeed the umbilical cord of intellectual life that can convene a larger community that is a campus. And if you could say that the idea of directed learning seen here in this kind of setting as we are right now in Kresge, where there's a speaker and an audience convened to hear one voice uh, project something that might be shared again, you could say that the sectional gift, if you will, of the Spanish steps is something altogether different. And in this case, there's a topographic need, infrastructural in nature, to allow you to get from one level to the next, 
but along the way, enough interstitial pauses to allow an offhand encounter to occur in the city. And arguably, the idea of one individual to another, to many individuals together, is the intellectual model that a university can aspire to think about. The first project I'll share is the Barnard College Diana Center. And some of you know as Barnard College as somehow cast a little bit in the shadow of uh, Columbia University, literally and figuratively, but in fact an extraordinary four and a half acre uh, women's college. And, and yet it's behind a gate. And you could say that uh, as a school behind a gate, you discover behind that gate something extraordinary. Two landscapes, um, Lehman Lawn above and the historic courtyard below divided literally and figuratively and out of sight from each other because of a plaza that separated it. When a competition was held to do this 100,000 square foot Diana Center, unnamed at that time, it was called the Nexus, Judith Shapiro, then president, said it, she was calling it the Nexus because her idea was to convene many, many different people together and somehow transform this particular wall or barrier, this was the Macintosh Center, from a student center that walled the city off into now a place that could have architecture, art, theater, library, reading room, cafe, classrooms, et cetera, and convene the entire institution together. But 100,000 square foot, uh, it couldn't be the long lateral length in the corridor. It needed to extend up and through, and in our mind, reconnect the campus. So a building not just as one building, but one that connects the campus that has been divided and then taking that landscape gesture of connection as to one that would make it through the building itself so that there'd be an awareness at all times and a sectional convergence of the activities that are going on inside. So you can see a landscape gesture below, a spatial landscape scale gesture above, transforming that wall of a facade that had been the voice, if you will, of Barnard College into one that would become a kind of prismatic lens into really what's so extraordinary including the architecture school, which is the only projection in Cantilever off there, which is a senior architecture studio. Now, again, since food is a place that collects everybody, it's on the ground floor. And from this cafe, we are looking up to the reading room, the library, and the gallery critique space for art and architecture. But that collapsed idea, if you will, the School of Athens is what allows you to be visually connected although acoustically separated because of the glass, but visually connected to all that is happening on every level, whether you can go there or not. And again, a kind of magic carpet, if you will, that connects visually the kind of chromatic sort of amber colors moving to red all the way through. So from the reading room, we're looking down all the way at a cafe. We're standing in the gallery critique space, so an architecture student might be able to text somebody to bring them up a coffee and still wave. Um, but more important was not to create a building. In our mind, it was to connect the divided campus. The campus was divided from the historic courtyard to the upper area by a huge wall and a 20-foot grade change, uh, which allowed a bowling alley to exist underneath. And our question was that if we could eliminate the bowling alley, could we, in fact, create a connected campus? And so this amphitheater now only holds classrooms rather than a bowling alley. But again, because a vertical campus doesn't have that luxurious crosswalk that a university in the Midwest might have, that crosswalk in diagonal green, if you will, is wrapped up and strapped onto the vertical face of the building in the campus with the staircase that connects. And again, that staircase that connects is one language that connects the institution, but in fact, it's the chroma of this externally acid-edged terracotta colored glass that connects it to the chroma, if you will, of the brick campus of Columbia and Barnard itself. And so this is it from the reconnected green. And ultimately, the idea was to take that barrier of a language, of an expression of an institution, into one that would be a place of invitation and ultimately be a place of connection as a hinge, if you will, between Barnard and Columbia. Columbia, by the way, is to the right. Now, the idea of campuses are so influential as ways of convening that even places like Novartis will think of not just a place to build, offices, but to build a campus. And this is Lampugnani's master plan for the Novartis campus in East Hanover, New Jersey. And again, Lampugnani being so very, very strict insisted that each and every building must be exactly 100 feet wide, 250 feet long, 75 foot high, and in a box. You could see our box there in red. Now, the extraordinary thing about that is the idea of working almost in a loft-like flexibility. They were committed to open office was had a companion, if you will, of a place of relaxation, that landscape. 
And it was that idea of relaxation that brought us to think about the other point of relaxation in an office area is a place you convene or relax at home. What if that idea of a living room or a landscape could carve its way through this box to be a continuous convener of everybody since the open office moves everybody so frequently? So literally stripping and scarring that box now with a place of collaboration is what we've done here, lined with wood, a staircase, um, and in fact, a kind of ascending living room, if you will, with a, with a chair that we designed with Vitra that would be large enough and welcoming enough to hold you together. But that at any given moment, you could simultaneously look at the open office, in this case above, the convening space below, and understand that the simultaneity of this place of invitation to work or relax and convene is always in evidence. And literally, that cut is a marker that through its uh, specular reaction connects to the landscape and the, and the a uh, wonderful sort of halcyon environment around it, but that cut is what marks the place of convening. Now, Cornell Tech, Roosevelt Island, and I think Roger uh, Duffy did this extraordinary job of explaining the complexity of Bloomberg's uh, sort of gift of, of a vision to say that we need to actually create a kind of tech uh, environment here that's research-based that actually can propel, propel New York City forward in this strange and isolated place. And the whole idea was saying that directed research, you could say, has a delayed application. The startup entrepreneurial garage model is one that's super accelerated. Can we, in fact, infuse and put these two worlds together, what Silicon Valley does in miles laterally? Could we actually condense into one setting on this island? And so if you look at this, our, our question is, if you look at this multi-phased thing, the idea of creating a campus that needs to feel complete at any given moment means that a certain building and you could see our building right here. That footprint was a strange and hermetically sealed one. And our question was, how could we in fact open it up literally to the city, river to river, get peripheral views of light all the way around, and allow the kind of incubator spaces that will be filling the upper levels complement the lower level research university space, because in fact they share 30% Cornell Tech, 70% uh, startup. Again, that kind of conf uh, conflation of these things is really about trying to create in one building Silicon Valley's great success. And our point was by relaxing that section through pulling the landscape in and pressing in and compressing the base of the building, we could in fact actually have a kind of crystalline lens at which the center is where uh, this kind of collaboration happens, where in fact views into, through, and across the building are literally how those lab spaces and incubator spaces find themselves together. Again, you can see the teaching spaces and uh, lab spaces, if you will, for the uh, Cornell Tech on the lower level and the convening space looking out. So that, in fact, this is it um, just a few days ago. If you see those columns holding up the cantilever, which will be covered outdoor spaces, those will be gone next week when the trusses are completed. But the trusses themselves allow a, effectively a column-free wing on either side supported only at its core and its periphery. So that loft-like flexibility remains. And again, it's, it's sort of a, a spectacle, if you will, from the East River, um, and one that, if you will, uh, we hope in about a year from now will be a place of great innovation and invention. Um, a place that you may be familiar with, MIT at Kendall Square, is extraordinary because this is a moment where MIT is doing a piece of campus making and city making and entrepreneurial life being built around that hinge, literally at a hinge point. And at Kendall Square, if you will, our red box, if you will, with a formerly known as Site P, now Building 5, um, is actually at this hinge point where it is a place where it truly must look in every direction possible. That hinge point literally is taking a star and giving one, a four-sided building eight sides. Those eight sides themselves are topographically operated in section. The first cut, if you will, the invisible one, the subway or the T. The next layer, if you will, at ground, the retail spaces, plus the MIT Museum. The next two levels, if you will, the MIT Museum. And that breaker scar there sets up all the kind of incubator and office spaces above. It is more importantly, though, a gateway. And the symbol of actually tilting the building back to open that gateway and to the T itself is to say that this is a district that is a future destination now, but one that will truly leverage a piece of campus making, city making, and ultimately a new relationship, if you will, that says that this innovation district 
uh, has a building uh, which is mon one of many that is now a citizen of a new precinct. And this last project really is this notion of what is it to be a citizen uh, in a city and a citizen in a university as a building. And that citizenship, if you will, of campuses has tended to fall around the notion of landscape being a legible component of how you know you are in this, in this uh, campus setting. If you look on one side, the city of Philadelphia has already defined itself through its greens, but the city of uh, Philadelphia is uh, on the other side of the river, the University of Pennsylvania, it had to decant roads to create green space to be able to have an identity. But as the campus is moving east and connecting to the city, this funny red C shape here is it, where the School of Engineering's buildings are, not an ounce of green space. So our thinking when we were looking at this nanotechnology building opportunity, all we heard were constraints. The biggest one, if you will, in this one area is that nanotechnology needs to have uh, research labs that are vibration free and electromagnetically free. So that means that there's a sweet spot and only one spot where one could actually locate the labs which is in the back of the site. So our question was could we actually invert this equation and while we might put those labs that have those vibration and EMI sensitivities in the back, could we also allow this building to become a citizen of shaping an open space and look back to the campus and city? So this unfurling of things that need to simultaneously happen means city making and campus making below, research within, a kind of trajectory of movement above, and a crystalline uh, periphery that allows you to look in and actually welcome the sciences. So if you look at this now, you could say that we were so fortunate that the university also had a dean, Eduardo Glant, who loved art. You could see he rescued this Tony Smith out of uh, storage. Um, but one who wanted the research to be seen. And so if you look at now on the inside, what we were struck by is that every nanotechnology building that we visited had one solid door with a little portal in it that was yellow. And we asked what that was for and learned that it was to cut out the electromagnetic, or sorry, to cut out the infrared light. And we said, well, if, if that does the trick, can we have a, a, a yellow wall, an amber wall, and show the research inside? So this is what you see is the amber wall. Um, that looks into the clean room, which has this, you know, it's the cleanest place you can imagine in the world. We as humans are so dirty that we need to be in bunny suits. But that lens, if you will, that ember lens, is to allow the scientists to look out and those who are working from the outside to look in. In the lowest level, where the characterization uh, suites are, which must have no vibration, this is all concrete based, we even drag the landscape down to pull some light into this microscopy characterization lab. But in fact, more importantly, was to say that rather than sort of load the kind of research spaces around one uh, shared corridor, by opening it up and unfurling it into a C shape, we were able to actually say that you could look in. Now, elevators have to be at far ends of the building because they're electromagnetic and vibration interference, which means that you need to have the most irresistible stairs because lab buildings have a 20 foot floor to floor. The stair needs to really be something that is broken down in such a way that we could actually create collaborative spaces along the way. But also the idea was again like the School of Athens, allowing to collapse into one space those things that should be seen beyond, including the conference and meeting spaces, so that there's a sense of what's going on. So even at the very, very top, where we're looking at the uh, cantilever overlook, that that is a space where everybody can convene with talks, et cetera. But in fact, the real convening is the place of movement and circulation. And that is the place that is most legible and luminous uh, to the city by day and to the campus by night. Ultimately, where the individuals gather or where the, those convene is, is uh, the signature, if you will, is in the cantilever, which is closest to the edge of the campus. But most importantly, and the thing that I think we're most excited about is that the one building becomes a citizen of the campus and a protagonist for bringing that whole idea of shaping a landscape and creating a new lens to research sciences. So again, I think through all these examples, our hunch is that the research and uh, productivity that happens here at MIT that will be happening with Great Extreme out in Kendall Square is actually taking that notion of the research, the university building, and the campus and its citizenship in the city is a way of actually projecting something far larger into the world. Thank you.
Thank you, Marion. And uh, you did show us the two buildings. I hoped you would. That was terrific. One more speaker, Carlo Ratti, uh, who practices in Italy. He's an architect and an engineer by training. And he's also at MIT, where he directs the Sensible City Lab. He um, ha holds uh, several patents. He's co-authored 250 publications. Don't know how he does it. His work has been exhibited worldwide at venues such as the Venice Biennale, the Design Museum in Barcelona, the Science Museum in London, Maxi in Rome, and the Museum of Modern Art in New, New York City. Um, Blueprint included him as one of 25 people who will change the world. Where are you? He's down there, looking, smiling. Uh, Forbes listed him as one of the names you need to know. And um, Fast Company named him one of the 50 most influential designers in America. Two of his projects, the Digital Water Pavilion, um, which he did here at MIT, and the Copenhagen Wheel, uh, were included by time in the list of the best inventions of the year in 2007 and 2014. Um, he's an out-of-the-box thinker, and hopefully you will conclude this session with something that we don't know about. Thank you. Thank you, Dale. Um, don't believe all of that. Um, now, I'll, um, I want to share with you a few things about the work we've been doing on Innovation uh, District. Um, I want to start with this picture. Sorry, this, the, the slide is not too visible, but this is Le Corbusier, uh, one of the most respected architects of the, the past century. And uh, when in the 1930s he wrote the Charter 10, the Athens Charter, he claimed that actually everything in a city or on a campus had to be very well divided. And so he said in 1931, place for working, sleeping, leisure, and so on, had all to be separated. Now, if you think about a city like that, it's a huge waste. Um, it's a city where you, know, you uh, build, in a certain sense, a city for sleeping, and then use it only for part of the day, a city for working just for part of the day, a lot of traffic between them. So it is no surprise that since the 1950s and 60s and, and 70s, people really started thinking about mixed use. You know, Jane Jacobs, but many, many others, about how we can put different several uses together in, in space. Well, we think that today that is going perhaps one step further. It's about digital, how digital is changing, is impacting the way we work, and how is really changing the transition between public space and private space, the very structure inside our buildings. And let me give you one exam example taken from, from our campus. So what you see here is our beautiful campus, uh, almost like a little city inside the city. You see downtown Boston, MIT, don't bother, Harvard up there. And uh, um, if you take the MIT campus, it was one of the first places uh, in the world to be totally covered with Wi-Fi. And um, so what we saw over the years is this transformation between what you see to the left, uh, you know, how we used to work, or that's a computer room, how it used to be, uh, to work in a much more flexible way. Now, those two images are a bit biased. What you see to the left, I, I tried to find the most appalling computer room I could find, you know, no daylight, just artificial light and so on. To the right, it's, uh, it's beautiful, it's a sunny day, it's an always the, not always the case uh, during the winter, but you get an impression going to work from, a, uh, from put yourself to the left to, to something much more flexible. So what we said was, well, what if we could actually use the network? The network is changing the way we work and live, so what if you could monitor that in order to understand really these changes? So what is the network which is producing the changes could also help us to, to quantify them. So we went to MIT facilities, to MIT ASNT. Uh, we said, you know, can we have, can we start monitoring activity on the network? Here you see every dot is actually an access point on the MIT campus. And we started studying that. What you see there, you see people waking up at MIT and then moving on campus during the day. You see the bubble is the number of people and then you know how basically the pulse of, uh, of the campus. Uh, if you aggregate all of that uh, for the whole campus, this is a typical week at MIT. Uh, so you see this Monday morning, people get into campus around uh, nine o'clock. You see a few people still working nine to five. Uh, not that many. Most people still keep working till very late at night. You see the 10 or 11, even in the middle of the night, you got a lot of activity. And the same thing repeats on Monday, on Tuesday, on Wednesday, on Thursday, not on Friday, like all over the world activity slips away on, on Friday afternoon, as you see here. 
And then you go Saturday and Sunday, they're almost like normal days. Uh, you know, you just remove the nine to five people, and you always see a little thing here on Sunday night around, uh, around 9 or 10 p.m. And that's when you say, say, shit, tomorrow is Monday again, and then you go back to work. Anyway, so if you take this, what you can do today is something that was a, a, a dream for architects a few decades ago. You can get a real-time occupancy profiles for every space. And what you see here is every, most of the spaces at MIT, how they've been used over time, just by using the signals that are emitted in, in those spaces. Well, if you take all those signals and you mathematically analyze them, uh, here's a Fourier transform to, to cluster them, uh, then uh, what you find is uh, what I was saying before, the fact that digital is actually allowing us today to use space in a, in a different way, to have much more flexibility over time and over space. We can overlay different functions, and, uh, and it's really changing the way we, we're using space. With two things I wanted to, to highlight. Uh, the first one is you're using space in a more communal way. In a certain sense, you could think about uh, co-working, uh, perhaps also co-living, co-making, co this idea of sharing spaces over time in different ways. And the good news also to, to respond to what Israel was showing in the first presentation is that when you do this, you can use a square foot in a more efficient way. So on the one hand, you can use the space better. Uh, a lot of the spaces were play most of the time empty in the past, and then now we can use them better, but uh, also we can use them in a more sociable way. And so what we've been doing uh, is uh, extend the same analysis to, to other places. We did recently a piece of research at the Louvre Museum in, uh, in Paris. Again, we did the same thing. We looked at the signals emitted from electronics in order to see how people move in, in the Louvre Museum. Uh, there's a few scientific papers on this was in the Financial Times, uh, no, looking at, at this. And what we're do, trying to do is try to learn how this can tell us something about how we can design uh, new innovation spaces. I want to share a couple of images. This is a project we did with Dennis Frenchman, who is, I don't know if he's in, in the room, but uh, he's at MIT, a great colleague. And this is um, um, what we've been doing in Guadalajara, in Mexico, in an uh, in innovation, new innovation city there. Um, we actually work a lot of indoor and outdoor spaces that people could use as an extension to, for, for their offices. Here you see uh, some of the sketches for one of the incubator spaces in, in, in the city. Um, at the moment, with our office, we are working in some of the largest co-working spaces in, in Europe. You can see here some of the, some of the, the initial ones. Uh, and one of the things we are experimenting with there is how, when space is used in such a flexible way, how can you have all the systems in space actually follow occupancy. You, cannot, you can look at occupancy data in order to design a space, but also you can have a space that responds in real time to, to occupancy data. And in this case, for instance, all the heating, the cooling, and the lighting responds to people. Uh, if there's nobody in the space, the trace goes on standby, pretty much like, like your computer. So it becomes like something dynamic that responds to occupancy in, uh, in, in the space. Um, I wanted to finish with a couple of uh, examples. So we, this, this really applies to, to the master plan uh, scale. We saw it before, and you know what, you know, here in, in the case of uh, uh, Guadalajara or other places, um, it, it applies to the scale of the building itself, but also to, to furniture. I want to share with you just a couple of quick examples. Um, a couple of years ago, Cassina, uh, an Italian furniture producer, came to us and said, you know, well, can we think about how it's changing the way to use uh, um, a space such as a, a sofa, a couch? And uh, a long time ago, you might have uh, gotten home, you know, you take newspaper, a printed newspaper, you read it on the sofa. But today you might go there and you keep on working on a tablet. You might want a space that's both a coffee table or a place for working, for posting, for reading the newspaper, the same newspaper, but uh, in digital form, or just, you know, for meeting friends and, uh, and others. So we came up with, uh, with this uh, concept and they say, uh, sure, you know, that could be interesting, but how do, you, how do you do it? How do you build it? And, you know, there's no material that can do, can do that. Well, it turns out that if you take, uh, use digital fabrication and use uh, laser cutters and do pieces which are all slightly different, one from the other, you can combine them in a way to create a material that has an embedded programming that allows, allows it to take different uh, shapes. And uh, so here you see one of the first, again, one of the beauties of that we see every day here at MIT of digital fabrication is that you've got an idea, you can just you know, try it out, just you know, use a laser cutter, a 3D printer to, to prototype it. So here you see the, um, one of the first models 
something which is closed or it's open, and it has embedded in its geometry the, the stability in one shape or the other shape. And uh, here it was a slightly better model, made of wood and, uh, and aluminum. And, uh, and here you see the, the, product, the produced one. Interesting thing is that you then produce it also with the same techniques, so there's no difference anymore between the prototype and what then is produced in, uh, in big quantities, uh, again with laser cutting. And you combine all the different pieces and you get the, the final elements, as you see here, closed or open or, or open the, the other side. And I want to finish with something else that we will present uh, just in a couple of days in, uh, in Milan. Design Week in Milan is coming up, and, and one of the projects is, uh, is, again, the similar thinking about flexible spaces and reconfigurable spaces. Uh, this time we've been working with uh, Vitra, um, the Swiss uh, fur furniture, furniture, um, f whatever, the Swiss uh, furniture uh, uh, producer. And, um, and here we'll be thinking about uh, elements that have uh, little elements of furniture that have a linear actuator inside them, so they can go up and down. You can control that from your smartphone, so you can see the configuration from your smartphone, and then you can create a, a flexible dynamic space that constantly changes uh, uh, shape. Here's a little rendering of how it, uh, it might look. It's, uh, it's going to be an exhibition at the, at the Trinale. Uh, and I'll show you now, uh, it's not open yet, so this is not yet the video. It's just an animatics. It's just you know, putting together some images of how the video might look like after taking footage of, uh, of the real thing. But I'll show it to you anyway. It's the first time I'm showing it, so uh, just you know, as, a, as a sketch of how the project could be. I, I want to leave you with this, you know, with the fact that basically technology is changing the way we, we are living, the way we are working, we are more flexible, and in a certain sense, architecture is responding. It is responding both in the way that we know more about uh, occupancy, so we can design in a different way, but also architecture can become more like a living, responsive skin. Architecture always being something like the third skin. You've got your own skin, our own skin, and then the skin of clothes, and then the skin of architecture. But that, that skin has always been more like a corset, something really rigid that didn't adjust to us. We had to adjust to architecture. Perhaps in the future we can think about an architecture that follows us, that responds to us, more like a living skin. Thank you. Thanks, Carla. I did ask for something we haven't seen before, and I think we just have had that. Great. So tomorrow morning, uh, we start again at 8.30. I'm sorry the panel has run late too, but um, that's the inevitability. Uh, thank you all for your contributions to this um, event, and uh, uh, thank you, audience, for being patient. Good. <laughs>